The following game was played between Gary Kasparov, uh, pardon me, Anatoly Karpov, who was white, and Gary Kasparov. It was from their world championship match in Moscow in 1985. It was the 16th game of that match. I annotated the game in the book Winning Chess Brilliancies, and every time I play through this game, it's just like this awe-inspiring you know, awe game. It's like, I want to say alien chess. These guys play differently than me. Okay. In those days, Anatoly Karpov was a monster with the white pieces. He basically, he basically played E4, and he said, I win. <laughs> Hey, I'm white. I got e4. I win. And he, and he, his philosophy was win with black, win with white, draw with black, and he was the dominant player from the 1975 to 1985 uh, in the world of chess. And his handling of the white pieces with one e4 was terrifying. Okay. So that's the setup. Gary played his patented c5, the Sicilian, knight f3, going uh, for the open Sicilian, e6, d4, c5 takes d4, knight takes d4. So we have uh, the opening developing pattern in front of us. Still a lot of chess theory to go. If anybody has any questions, by the way, just raise your hand and I'll be happy to call on you and to explain any particular move. So knight takes d4. The knight came out to c6. And as we can see, just from the opening move uh, for a moment, there's a temporary, I think I can use that word, temporary hole is that, that, that square d6 uh, is only defended by the dark squared bishop and Anatoly jumped on that by playing the move knight b5. So his idea is that he wants to play knight d6 check and force the capture of the bishop and then queen takes d6. d7, d6 plugging up the hole. <laughs> you can't attack there anymore. So White has moved his knight several times, and what, what he aims to achieve is what is called the Maroxi bind. He played c to c4. There was a Hungarian player by the name of Giza, or Geza Maroxi from Hungary, who loved, from Hungary, loved to set up his pawns on c4 and e4, and the whole idea of this setup with these pawns was to control this very, very key square in the middle of the board, the d5 square. Okay. Um, c4. Knight f6. Attacking the pawn on e4. Knight defends. Oh, escape. Let me just try this. Aha. See, uh, 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 uh. I can change colors too. By the way, I mean, so like, just to let you know, just so uh, I'm not one. I'm not only green light. You know, I can do red, yellow. <laughs> a7, a6, attacking the knight, and chasing it to the side of the board. Knight a3. So what White's idea is is he wants to play. Bishop e2, bishop e3, castles, queen d2, bring his rooks into the center, and keep black cramped. He wants to keep black. He would love to see black play moves like bishop e7, bishop d7, castles, and black doesn't have much space. White plays behind his broad center so that he could put his bishops on e3 and e2. Yes. What's the benefit of going to a3 with the knight as opposed to d4? Uh, at that time, the idea was that because white has a cramping position against his opponent, 
When the knight comes back to d4, it gives black the opportunity to trade pieces. So white wants to avoid uh, trading the pieces for the moment and to let black enjoy the cramped position he has. So if I have an advantage of space and we're down into a king and pawn endgame, it might not be meaningful. But if the board is full of pieces and I have a big cramping uh, influence in the center, your pieces won't have as much mobility as mine. Cramped because his two center pawns aren't falling. Yeah, the cramped because these two center pawns control, yeah, are more advanced and control those square. So we do it another way, as we did it in the first class. The pawn on e4 controls two black squares. Pawn on e6 doesn't control any of whites. Pawn on c4 controls two black squares. Pawn on d6 doesn't control any of whites. So this position, remarkably enough, has been reached thousands of times over a century, a century and a half, maybe even longer. And Gary came up with an absolutely wild, surprising move. Played d5. It's like, bang, in your face. What's up with that? White's whole strategy up to now has been to stop this advance. And Gary just says, I'm advancing. This is, for me, um, what chess is at the highest levels, is a battle of ideas. That's really what it comes down to, right? You have your ideas, I've got my ideas. White's idea was to stop this advance. Black said, you haven't stopped the advance. White said, yes, I have. <laughs> Anatoly Karpov played C takes D5. E takes d5, e takes d5, knight b4. Now what black is saying is um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to win back this pawn on d5. What you going to do about it? What do you think white should do about it, young man? Yeah, yeah, bishop c4. That looks like a really natural move. You're developing a bishop that hasn't... Yeah, and you're protecting the pawn. What could be more simple? So bishop c4. So let's imagine that black plays b5, attacking the bishop. You want to keep that pawn protected, don't you? So you would play bishop back to b3. Then let's say black played bishop to e7. We would castle. Absolutely. Absolutely. Castles. Castles. Then we understand what black wants to do. Black's next move, his intention, is to play bishop b7 and to attack the pawn on d5 yet again. Notice that one of the strange things is that this knight on a3 is really ineffective. Okay. So what Karpov did, and I think bishop c4 is a very good move, but Karpov made uh, a little bit of a deeper insight. Karpov said, I bet, I bet I know what my opponent wants to do. I bet my opponent wants to play b5 and bishop b7. I bet he's going to do that. So I'm going to put my bishop on e2. Uh, sorry, just a second. Uh, new main line. Bishop on e2. And I'm going to invite black to recapture his pawn. And one day, my bishop's going to go to f3. If black tries that b5, bishop b7 business, I'm going to put my bishop on f3. OK. So Gary Kasparov said, you can keep your pawn. I'll play bishop c5. Again, did I say alien chess? <laughs> but black's got more the two knights on the uh, d5 pawn and the queen. Pardon me? So, yes, exactly. So, w you know, like I'm like you guys. I, man, I, I love pawns. Why on earth didn't uh, black capture the pawn? Yeah, what were you thinking there? 
Yeah, exactly. So let's imagine that he had played knight on b takes d5. White's intention was to castle. Okay. Now, let's say bishop to e7. Knight takes f knight uh, knight takes d5. Knight takes d5. Bishop comes out here to f3. Now, our bishop on f3 is doing really good stuff, man. It's like attacking the knight. It's on this diagonal. So you don't want to move that knight. You want to defend it. You play bishop e6. Outwardly, to all appearances, black's pretty OK. Like, what's wrong with black's position until you see this move knight c2? Now you start to think, uh-oh, I got a issues. The knight is going to come to d4, and then it's going to take my bishop. So I'm going to lose the two bishops in an open, open board. But even worse, when the knight comes to d4 and takes the bishop, it's going to mess up my pawn structure. Why can't he play f6? f6 now? OK. So the move f7, f6. So the idea, your idea, if I can guess it, is that when I move my knight, you want to be able to move, retreat your bishop. OK. So I'll centralize the knight, knight to d4 attacking the bishop. The bishop will drop back one square, and I'll play knight f5. I'm attacking the bishop on e7, but more importantly, at the moment, I'm attacking this pawn on g7. Maybe I also want to play rook e1. But there's a real nice trick. You want me to show you a nice trick? Imagine that you castle. You know this one? What is it? Yeah, then I win the two bishops. But even nicer is this one. Bishop takes d5. Bishop takes d5. Ooh, that's a juicy one, isn't it? Check. And I've got the royal fork. Uh, if the queen takes d5, I get the royal fork. So this was all looking very normal. And then the question was why he didn't take the pawn. Well, it's a deep answer. And sorry I had to go that deep. But that's what that was all about, was that it turns out that the knight somehow ends up being vulnerable on the d5 square. Well, Gary, instead of recapturing, played the move bishop c5. He simply developed. And white castled. And black castled. And white played bishop f3. And now, at the time, I didn't get it at all. I thought, wait a minute. Isn't Anatoly, well, what is Gary doing? Isn't Anatoly Karpov a pawn ahead and a pass pawn ahead, you know? And, you know, isn't black in bad shape? Well, I got to tell you, was I in for a surprise? So was Anatoly Karpov. <laughs> Anatol Gary just kept developing like, hey, no problem. I'll just bring my pieces out. How are you going to bring your pieces out? With the move bishop f5, what makes that move so particularly good? Could somebody, yes, young man. Um, it controls the c2 square? Yeah. It controls the c2 square, so this knight can't come here. Also, if the knight comes to c4, sometimes you can pop into d3, attacking the rook as well as the knight. So the move bishop f5 kind of freezes the knight on a3, keeping that knight out of the game. White develops his piece. Black says, hey, the, the rook 
I just bring the rook to the open file, just putting my pieces on very good squares. Rook e8. Queen came to d2. And now Gary played the move b7, b5. Like, he's just a pawn down, but he's ignoring, you know, like, I'd be sweating cannonballs. I'm a down a pawn. How am I going to get it back? Gary ignores the pawn, and he says, with this move b7, b5, I'm really limiting this knight. The knight can't come here. The knight can't come here. The only thing that knight can do is move backwards. To original, to original square. Exactly. So, hey, you're a pawn up, that's okay, yeah, I'm a pawn up, rook on a to d1, the rook comes behind the pawn, maybe one day, black's not watching, this pawn might come up the board, supported by the queen as well as the rook, rook a d1. Gary made a great move. Knight to d3. That knight just comes dead in the center White center. Uh, earlier, uh, a class I had earlier tonight was talking about primary squares for knights. Well, that's our primary square, baby. That knight just comes right in the center of the board. And by the way, it also unleashes a potential threat of b5, b4, attacking one of the knights, forking the knights. Okay. So uh, white wants to step out of this, uh, excuse me, white wants to step out of this threat of b5, b4, so he steps back with his knight and with the idea that he's going to unravel uh, going forwards. Okay, black puts the question to white's bishop, h7, h6. Do you want to take my knight or don't you? And Anatoly answers the question, mm, no, I don't. Bishop h4 drops back. Now, great, white's a pawn up, and uh, what's the problem? I think that uh, black is going to have a hard time here. Eventually, this bishop might just simply drop back to e2 and kick this knight out of the way, so uh, aren't isn't white just a pawn ahead? How many of you would prefer to have white? I, I'd raise my hand. <laughs> I like the extra pawn. But uh, Gary had seen very, very deeply in the position, and he played the move b4, attacking white's knight. White played knight a4, and Gary simply retreated the bishop, and Gary said, I'm a pawn down, but your pieces are terrible. The knight on a4 is out of the center. The knight on b1 has no, it hasn't moved. It, 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 it's like on its original square. Yeah, exactly. At the moment, even though he's a pawn ahead. So uh, Karpov, seeing nothing better, played the move bishop g3, and Gary said, okay, I'll put my rook on this open file. Oh, hold on just a second. Uh, yeah, baby. So I got two arrows. So it's sort of like all of the good squares, if you will, belong to Gary, and all of the misplaced pieces, the knight on a4, the knight on b1, belong to Anatoly, even though all of his new moves up to this moment look pretty normal. Yes? It's kind of ironic because Karbov has the isolated queen pawn, and he's the one that's supposed to have his rook in the open file. And right. And but this knight on d3 is like an octopus, right? It's reaching into all of the key squares e1 and c1, you can't bring your rooks, and the knight controls a lot of space. So really strategic masterpiece that is happening at the moment. And Anatoly says, 
uh, well, I better uh, free up the square b2 so that I can drop back here with my knight, excuse me, I can drop back here with my knight, get rid of your uh, very, very powerful knight on d3, and then I'm going to have fun. Then it's my turn. Uh, I'll have the extra pawn, and we'll see how you enjoy yourself. Okay. So we can see that white actually has some kind of a strategic threat of sorts. And that threat is to play knight b2. And black has to react promptly. What move do you think Gary played? What did Gary do? By the way, just a warning. Anybody who gets it right comes up here and we trade places. <laughs> <laughs> Any guesses? Any guesses? It's sort of like black has kind of maximized. Well, maybe his queen isn't maximized. His rooks, his knights, his bishops, everything is playing. Even the queen is actually OK on d8. So with all of his pieces maximized and Gary needing to create threats, played the move g5. Ooh, g5. You know, launching the pawns in front of your king, you know, as a coach, I would like slap your hands and say, what are you doing? You know, you're making me look mad over here. You, didn't you know your parents were watching? g5, exposing your king, but creating a very, very nasty threat of g4 in the position. Why is this threat nasty? Because when you play g4, you drive the bishop back, the knight jumps to e4, queen captures the knight, knight takes the bishop, discovering attack against the queen, the knight, and the rook, and the rook. Mm -hmm. So white would lose material in the face of g5, g4. Bishop takes d6, queen takes d6, g3 in order to make a retreat for the bishop, just kind of like what you were saying, that f6 move you suggested. So g3 to make a retreat for the bishop. So black to play. What did Gary play? Young man. Oh, by just simply taking the pawn. Knight takes b5. That's probably a move that I'd make, <laughs> taking the pawn. And it looks reasonable. So maybe we would go, for example, knight takes pawn, knight back to b2. And yeah, yeah. Well, here's the thing. It's a kind of a deeper thought. I like your move. Okay, flat out, I like recapturing the pawn. But in a, in, a, in a sense, like after knight takes d5, let's say knight b2, the queen and the rook on the d-file, the d-file is open to threats, right? So Gary actually played the move knight d7. And this was actually a brilliant move. The idea is that black says that pawn on d5 messes you up. It, it means that your bishop is passive. It means that the d file remains closed. And I'm going to play around. The knight on f6 is now, so when the knight comes back to b2, we can play knight e5 and protect the knight. Also, this knight wants to come to e5 to attack the bishop. This was a very cool game. <laughs> knight d7. OK. So white just stepped back with his bishop. Anatoly sees that the knight wants to come to e5 and attack the bishop. So he moves his knight out of the way. 
uh, in anticipation of the night coming. Also, what Anatoly is thinking is that maybe this will allow him an opportunity in the future to play a move like f2, f4, and to try to take advantage of that launching of the g-pawn. What did Garry Kasparov do? What move did he make? Black to move. Black to move. Black to move. I'll give you a hint. The hint that I'll give you is that White's knights are out of play, but we know th that Anatoly wants to bring this knight on a4 back into play. How can you stop him? Sir? Pardon me? C5. Knight to c5, but that will allow White to make a, a trade of knights, okay? So how, yes? Bravo, bravo, queen f6. So the idea here was just to stop, just to st escape, just to control this f6 square and basically say to, to White, I'm not going to let you trade your offside knight for the good knight on d3. Queen f6. Notice that this knight on b1, it's terrible. Why is this knight on b1 terrible? Because this pawn on b4, it can't move. So Anatoly played a3 to try to bust out, breaking out of prison. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? You're going to let black, well, let white, a5. you bet, a5. A takes B4. You going to recapture with the knight? No way. You're going to recapture with the pawn. So here Anatoly is. He's a pawn up. But what on earth can he do for a move? His rooks can't move. His knights can't move. His bishop is moved already. And why are we going to move the bishop again? We can move the king. But that's not anything special. We've got Anatoly decides that he's got to move his queen out of the way so that he can put his knight on b1 to the d2 square. Where can he move his queen? Where can white move? White wants to move his knight to d2. Only square. Queen a2. The you got to admit that queen on a2 looks pretty, pretty pathetic, right? Like queen a2? Okay, queen a2. Bishop g6. This is like one of those very quiet moves that just basically says to white, go ahead, make a move, and with my bishop on g6, I'm opening up the queen uh, so that maybe I could jump with my knight and jump with my knight here so that my queen is improved. The bishop was blocking my view. And by the way, it's your turn. Go ahead, make a move. Now, Anatoly <laughs> realizes, gee, if I move my knight to e d2, the rook will come down and pin my knight. Well, I don't want to invite that rook into my camp. So Anatoly's disgusted with his extra pawn. <laughs> take my pawn. Just, just get rid of my pawn. Will you please take my pawn? So Anatoly's idea is that after queen takes d6, knight d2, rook e2, he can go knight c4 and attack the unprotected queen. Yeah. So Gary said, hey, man, I don't like your pawn. I don't need your pawn. I will play the move g5, g4. And what's the idea behind this move? Young man. Um, 
Yeah. And this pawn on g4 takes over some control of the light squares. Yes. So g4. Okay. Well, that idea of knight d2 and rook e2, allowing rook e2 simply didn't work. Anatoly said, okay, I'll bring my queen back. <laughs> queen d2. Uh, please take my pawn so that I could take the pawn on h6. Gary says, you can't have that one. No, no, no. I'll keep my pawn on g, uh, I'll play king g7 and keep my pawn. White is running out of things to do, and he finally decides, okay, he's got to bust out. He plays the move f2, f3. Notice that this move exposes white's king to some checks on a diagonal, like the queen could come here to d4 with check. So white does expose his, his, his king, but on the other hand, you got to do something. Okay. So Kasparov says, now, now is the time I want to capture the pawn. And white says, OK, great. I'll capture this pawn on g4. And black says, check to the king, king to h1. Knight comes to f6. Ooh. Now things. Notice again, the queen on d4 is in a dominant position. It dominates this knight. This knight on b1 is dominant. This knight on d3 is great. But now black wants to go knight e4 so that he can threaten a check on f2. And man, white is going to get busted. Knight f6, great move. OK, it's desperation time now for Anatoly. And Anatoly plays rook f4, attacking the queen. How many of you want to take the rook? Good. <laughs> Very good. So what did, what did Gary do? What move did Gary make now after rook f4? He's going to take your queen. <laughs> there you go. Move it somewhere. Yes, exactly. Knight to e4 anyway. Bang. Knight to e4 anyway. Blocking. Blocking the attack, attacking the queen, and threatening knight f2 check. Right? Queen captures d3. Bad move. Knight f2 check. Knight f2 check. Just a second. Yes, it was panic. Rook takes f2. Bishop takes queen. Rook on f to d2. So. Now, if it's white's turn, white wants to play knight b2 and take this bishop. <coughs> then he'll have three minor pieces for his queen, and white will be doing very fine. So what on earth could... Which move? Rook e3. So if you go... Oh, well, let's see it. If you go rook e3, what is your intention after knight b2? Ah. Rook d8. That, but then it's sort of like whose pieces are getting tied up. I'm not quite sure whose pieces are getting tied up. What Gary played was a really cool move. He went queen e3, and he said, I'm getting out of the pin. 
getting out of the pen. But can't white take the bishop? Why not? That's what he did. <laughs> it's legal. What move now are you going to make? Are you going to make take my rook? What? Yes. What? Take the rook. So your idea is that after I take the rook, I'll take your queen. Check. I'll move my bishop. You'll take my bishop. I'll move my king. You'll take. And then you'll be in exchange ahead. Maybe you'll win. Maybe you won't. Mm, maybe you won't. So Gary didn't take the rook. Yes, a beautiful move. Rook c1. Now his idea is if you take my queen, I'll take your rook, I'll take that rook, I'll take that bishop, I'll take that knight. <laughs> rook c1. And with this move, rook c1, he's also uh, threatening to take this knight and maybe also to take this rook and to take this pawn on b3. So rook c1, fantastic, dazzling move, knight b2. Knight b2. So now Gary is definitely winning, but did you guys ever notice one thing about chess? One of the most difficult things in chess is to win a winning position. <laughs> Boy, I tell you, I th I'm sure I'd have 300 more rating points if I won all the winning positions that I let escape. So here, Black has a winning position, and he's got to bring home the bacon. How would you achieve that? How, <laughs> how do you win a winning position? Well, my, yeah, my first thought would be to take the rook and... Queen take that rook, rook takes that rook. That should be winning. You're right, that should be winning. Gary came up with an even more clever move. What move did Gary? Queen e1 check. That looks like a devastating move. I think queen e1 check would run into bishop f1. I'm not sure. Well, then I take the rook, and we get in that same, huh? We can take the rook first. Right. So you could go rook takes d1, rook takes d1, queen e1, check. I'd play here. And again, I'm losing. But, well, white is losing here. But I, I, it's not as absolutely cut and dry. So here, white, black has a really good move. Really, really, really good move. So queen e1 check, rook takes d1. Those are winning moves. But once you see black's next move, you think that was. Yes. Maybe commit suicide and rook not be committing suicide. <laughs> that, 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 yeah, that's suicidal. Rook takes b1, rook takes e3. Yeah, suicide. Um, are we ready? I know a little side. Queen e2. Close. Queen captures g3. That's, that's the best. <laughs> Gary found queen f2. Bam! Ooh! With the threat of rook e1, and it's going to be checkmate. Also notice that with this move, on top of everything else, there's queen takes b2. Notice that knight on b1 hasn't moved in like forever, right? So queen f2, knight d2. Now, how did uh, Gary mop him up? Yes. Rook takes rook, knight takes 
check and resigns. Yeah, knocked over the king. Isn't that an amazing game? I mean, just uh, it was both from a, a powerful strategic mastery uh, where white's pieces just kind of got pushed aside and black just took over all the key squares. So when I saw this game, I was like, wow, I don't play chess like that. <laughs> I mean, that was, that was pretty good. And that was one of the reasons why Gary was one of the most amazing world champions ever. This was an awe-inspiring game. Mm -hmm.